ஆ எஸ் மேம் ஆ லெட்ஸ் ஸ்டார்ட் மேம் குட் மார்னிங் एवरीबॉडी we may not always have a comfortable life we may not always be able to solve all of world's problems but we cannot underestimate the power of mankind because history has always shown that courage can be contagious and hope can take on a life of its own amidst all the chaos due to corona crisis it's really nice to meet you all through the virtual learning platform webex for the two day online faculty development program on sensitization on intellectual property rights by mrs dula jamima advocate and mediator bengaluru With the same enthusiasm and joy, I would like to invite Dr. Asha, Quincy Asha Das, IQC Coordinator, Sonia T. Thomas, Elizabeth College for Women, to welcome the resource person. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah. A pleasant morning to one and all present here. Chevalier T. Thomas, Elizabeth College for Women, the first self-nonsing college under the University of Madras, was established in the year 1985. by the late dr elizabeth thomas under ctte press presently the chairman jesus j kanagaraj retired and the managing trustee and correspondent sri l palamulai retired ias officer have been the pillar and our main source of strength internal quality assurance cell of ctte college has been acting as a facilitative and participative voluntary unit in promoting holistic academic excellence Intellectual property rights policy is a cornerstone of innovation and creativity for academicians. This FDP is an attempt to spread awareness about IPR among faculty members. At the outset, I extend a warm welcome to the eminent speaker of the day, Mrs. Bula Jemima, advocate and mediator, Bangalore. She has 29 years of experience in handling civil and criminal cases. in addition to company and consumer matters she has been a trained mediator in the bangalore mediation center and a certified mediator by the indian institute of corporate affairs advocate bula is the vice president and practice head lean on me legal bangalore she has a penchant for writing and has contributed various articles concerning legal issues we are very happy to have such a multi faceted personality in our midst today welcome you madam thank you i am greatly delighted to welcome all participants who have shown interest from all over india we are happy to have more than 520 participants for this fdp i welcome our principal in charge dr meenakshi who is the guiding force behind us i thank the management for their constant support in all our efforts Once again, I extend a warm welcome to one and all present here. Now we request Advocate Bula to take over the session. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, one and all, and uh, welcome to this uh, faculty development program. It's indeed my privilege to be your resource person for this topic: uh, sensitization on intellectual property rights. our uh, objective for the next two sessions that is this one and tomorrow will be to empower you with the knowledge of uh, intellectual property right and all that you have to know and the need for its protection and uh, i would be taking you briefly uh, on the indian laws in uh, respect to intellectual property rights so thank you once again i thank the organizers organizers for having me over thank you so much to begin with um i say intellectual property what do you understand say the definition of property is something that you own it's your belonging your possession and when i say intellectual that means this is a possession or a property of your intellect that is your own creativity and your own creation right so what is the advantage of your creation the advantage of your creativity of which you are the creator gives you a monopoly over your creation so that no one else can exploit this creation to your disadvantage right so this is what intellectual properties there are various categories and as i take you through today's topics and it continues tomorrow as well 
So I will be sharing uh, PowerPoint presentations with you all. I hope I'm clear. And um, though, you know, the content is more, I've tried my best to manage it so that I can take you through the whole uh, facet of intellectual property. And I hope it uh, helps. Thank you again. So let me share some slides with you. So today's uh, topics will, I just start with introducing what intellectual property, which I've also given already, and the history of intellectual property as to how it began to take shape and why we need intellectual property and how can intellectual property be protected uh, copyright. Uh, today, we will only deal with one category of intellectual property, that is copyright. And I include ICT innovation and time permits, maybe a little on the Designs Act as well. So uh, here we go. <clears throat> so as you see, intellectual property law is all about uh, the exclusive rights over your invention, over your creativity, which includes copyright, and then the trademark, which uh, identifies or signifies, signifies your entity with another, your business with another. This is in short, uh, I have just put all of this, which makes up intellectual property law. And see, this is intangible property. It is a creation of your intellect. It is a creative product that is invented by the human mind and its creativity. And law treats IP or uh, intellectual, uh, IP's intellectual property for short. It is a property right, which means law treats it as a property right because it can be bought, it can be sold. There are legal rights, and consequences, obligations, all of it. So law looks at it as a property, just as you have immovable property and the Transfer of Property Act governs that. The same way, this is intangible property, uh, which is also, which law uh, uh, kind of treats it as a property right and intangible property, I can say. Now, the main categories of intellectual property are, you know, designs, patents, invention, authorship over your uh, work, uh, and that is copyright protection and brands which come under trademark. And I will just classify into four main categories. That is patents. First, let's go with patents. Patents. Patent is a document that acknowledges the invention and it gives protection to the inventor over his invention, right? And this invention can be exploited by somebody else only if it is authorized by the inventor. Now, the second one is the industrial designs, which is the Second category, which uh, is important. As I said, four categories are mainly important. One is the patent, the industrial designs, and then the trademarks and the copyright. Industrial design is an exclusive right over the design and shape of an object or source designed and so shape. Of course, there are a lot of other, uh, you know, uh, 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 there are other things which you need to look into, but I'm just giving you a very short definition before we go into the nitty-gritties and all about that particular, which we will be doing today and tomorrow. And trademarks, again, is a sign or signs that distinguishes the goods and the service of, you know, one business over another, one entity over another. Copyright is, again, a right given. It's uh, protecting, rewarding your creativity. It's a right given over your literary work, your dramatical work, your musical work your artistic work, and uh, producers of cinematograph films, sound recording. So this is a right given to those uh, for your creativity. So this is, in brief, the main categories of intellectual property. Um, so as I told you, patent. And um, the next... Uh, Coming into the origin and the history. So we just first go into after having understood what is intellectual property and the categories of it, let's understand the history behind intellectual property. Uh, 
See, Italy is thought to be the framework of the intellectual property system. Uh, in fact, a Venetian law uh, long back in 1474 made its first method, method, methodical attempt to protect invention in a form of a patent. Now, the invention of the printing press and the mobile type by Johannes Gutenberg, a German uh, inventor, around the year 1450, this helped in the origin of the first copyright system in the world. Subsequently, it was the British law in 1623. And, you know, at that time, all the major industries were controlled by guilds. These guilds, they were responsible for bringing inventions from everywhere to the marketplace. This was essentially brought to give protection and ownership over inventions. By the end of the 19th century, there were, you know, as you know, industrialization took place, there was travel, and, you know, it sort of the globe shrunk into a global build in the sense in 19th century, there's so many inventions, economy, boost of economy, growth of cities, investment of capitals, and, you know, there's these, and many countries, it led to establish modern intellectual property laws. Now, the international intellectual property system, it began to shape, take shape with the creation of the Paris Convention. The Paris Convention was held in 1880, in the 19th century, you know, uh, when rapid industrialization took place and everything then came the Paris Convention. This was mainly to protect industrial property. And this was also an international agreement through which inventors could protect their invention, even if they're being used in other countries. Um, so, as I told you, as you can see, that uh, uh, the writers, even in the Paris Convention, the Protection of Industrial Property, this was in 1883, and subsequently, the writers came together in 1886 for the Berne Convention, and this led to the protection of, at an international level, of all forms of written expressions, whether it was songs, poetry, literature, uh, you know, stories, drawings, sculptures, paintings. So that was the beginning and the culmination of the copyright system. This was the Berne Convention. And then the Trademarks Agreement was in 1891, which was in Madrid. It was called the Madrid Agreement, where trademarks were given protection. Subsequently, so, you know, as we are evolving, you all know, we are evolving and every day is a progress that we make in terms of intellect, in terms of technology and advancement in technology, industrialization and so on and so forth. So subsequently, what happened in uh, 1967, the Paris and the Berne Convention, they combined to become the United International Bureau for the Protection of Intellectual Property. And that is the precursor of today's World Intellectual Property Organization, in short, known as WIPO, which we know. This was a self-funding agency of the United Nations and established in 1967. Now, under the World Intellectual Property Organization, now, what was given recognition? Now, we all, I'm sure you all of you would have heard of it. Now, what were the topics that were given recognition under the World Intellectual Property Organization were trademarks, as you can see, service, service marks, commercial names and legislations, invention in all fields, industrial designs, protection against unfair competition, literary, artistic, scientific works, scientific discoveries, performances of artists, uh, uh, broadcasts. And so WIPO, in fact, became a reference source. You know, it provided for international rules so that all member countries had to comply with those rules if they were becoming, a, a, you know, a part of this. And this WIPO actually emphasized a protection of intellectual property across borders to resolve disputes, to connect different intellectual property systems across the world and share knowledge and programs. So that was about the intellectual property system which took place. Then, then, subsequently, the World Trade Organization was established and then came a multilateral agreement treaty on intellectual property. And this was called as the TRIPS Agreement 
or it's in short, and the expanded form is trade-related intellectual property system. This was formed in January 1995. This incorporated every form of IP and gave standard of protection to every kind of intellectual property and enforcement of the rules and regulations, both at national and international level. And under this agreement, Service marks as well was included. First, it was only trademarks, but under the TRIPS agreement, service marks for any service provided by an entity or an individual, even those marks, service marks were included, industrial designs were included, the Designs Act came. Previously, it was the Patents and Designs Act 2011, but subsequently, uh, uh, in 1911, I'm sorry, and then the Designs Act came into force in our country and, and then it was copyright related rights geographical indications of goods act because this was in compliance with the trips agreement and then labeled designs of assimilated circuits and plant uh, patents which included uh, protection of varieties of plants biodiversity all this came so this was an evolution so after the trips agreement and india was a signatory to the said agreement so in India, initially, only four forms were protected. So this was the history of thing. And now let's come to the history of India as such. I was giving you a world history. I'm coming to India's history of intellectual properties. Copyrights were regulated under the Copyright Act 1957. Trademarks under the Trademarks and Merchandise Act 1958. Patents under the Patents Act 1970. And Designs under Designs Act. So with India, um, uh, sorry, could somebody mute it? I think someone else is speaking. Kindly mute it. I hope it's audible to everybody. So with India became becoming a signatory to the agreement on trips, the above acts were amended. All these patents, copyright, which I just told you, they were all amended because they had to be compliant on the trips, trips agreement. Because TRIPS agreement set minimum standards for protection and IPR rights and also set a time frame where India could comply with whatever the TRIPS agreement because India was a signatory. So to be compliant with TRIPS agreement, a time frame was set and we had to amend our laws accordingly. We were about to make changes in our laws with the required degree of protection the TRIPS mandated. So other than this, as I told you, plant varieties, geographical indications, they were also in, enacted as new legislations. The existing legislations as the copyrights, trademarks, patents were amended and new legislations were also enacted as the Geographical Indications of Goods Registration and Protection Act in 1999 and Protection of Plant Variety Acts and, Far and Variety and Farmers' Rights Act 2001 was respectively enacted. So this is, in short, um, the history of intellectual property world and in India as such. Now going to our next uh, heading, uh, that is importance of intellectual property and why should intellectual property be protected? See, we live in a globally competitive environment, as you all know. And um, so... Intellectual property is very critical because it fosters innovation and invention. It encourages. And uh, we need to protect it so that somebody else doesn't copy it, someone else doesn't exploit it, and we get the reward for our creativity. It is simple, right? It's, 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 it just uh, makes one thing that why not I have this recognition and protection over my and you know, benefit from what I have invented or what I've created. So intellectual property is critical for its inventions and invention, which is enforcers and which it encourages. Now, when you don't protect your idea, you don't... Yeah? You can protect your idea, your business. Individuals will reap benefits. Otherwise, you know, idea remains an idea unless it comes into form and existence. And, you know, you even research and development over your invention boosts the economy of your nation. It helps you in many ways to uh, help national economic growth. Besides artisans for their performances, for their talents, for their creations, they are rewarded so that, you know, they're recognized and acknowledged and probably monetarily uh, not probably, uh, they are monetarily uh, rewarded too. So 
So in that sense, you know, uh, uh, intellectual property is important. And why should we protect protect it? It's because it's a unique identity for your business, right? And nobody should be able to get a free ride over your creativity, over your creation, over your invention. So intellectual property has to be protected. It is important. And more many businesses, many SMEs, small and medium enterprises, and other industries where uh, who uh, you know uh, they are they have to necessarily protect their uh, businesses and you know so that somebody else doesn't copy that or somebody else doesn't get this concept and you know make an unlawful gains or unjustly enrich themselves so this intellectual property helps you to differentiate one goods of a company or one company to another or services of one company from another one business entity from another so any person who has a unique identity or an idea or a creation is has got something and you know he lets it known people will always want to benefit from that right and probably for their own monetary gains or for whatever for uh, uh, you know publicity or for recognition for whatever praise uh, so you know and then what happens is there is infringe so when you have to you know take the help of law to enforce against infringement then it needs to be protected and protection is through registration into in those respective acts so ip protection can be taken for all kinds of businesses all the different symbols diff- different symbols different emblems brand logo whatever so intellectual property protection you can take for all these kinds and sizes of business and in the benison invention your creation your creativity and you get exclusive rights over your invention and you can get paid for your invention businesses are valued because of your inventions you would be able to uh, you know uh, get monetary gains even if you want to sell your businesses valuation is done on your intellectual property inventions so as as long as an idea is there in your mind in your intellect it has no value but when it is brought into existence which can be seen or which can which is tangible though it's tangible but its presence is very visible so you can then turn it into a commercial activity registering patents and com be right which can result in a steady stream and revenue extra revenue besides as i told you already you can monetize on merger and sale if you're amalgamating your business or merging it with another business you know they value not only your mobile assets mobile property your capital and your capital infrastructure fixed capital which all you know which all of you know it is not only that but even on your intellectual property asset for valuation for business and it can also be used as collateral for debt financing even while applying for government uh, you know allowances for funding for the subsidy this can increase the competitiveness of a business in an export market besides even for branding when you you use your products in other countries other than your own country other than your country of invention you know this is really helpful for marketing for your identification your brand is recognized and for using this for manufacturing or for producing or for exporting whatever your goods and services in a foreign country and also you can seek franchising agreement with overseas firms and uh, as i said export of patented goods which accelerates your business growth which helps you a lot so uh, and when there is piracy when somebody copies or when somebody pirates steals or robs your uh, software or there is a piracy or counterfeiting there is definitely there is theft of intellectual property and this can pose a serious threat so unless it is registered and how do you approach the court of law so this is why intellectual property has to be protected right so uh, so we just took you so i just took you through the history and why intellectual property needs to be protected and uh, what is the benefit of protecting your intellectual property our next topic today is copyright which is a category of intellectual property so i will be telling you about what uh, why what is copyright what is the definition of copyright and mainly i will be talking to you about the different um, you know uh, provisions under the copyright act 
in what kind of a legal protection copyright act is. In written in a literary form, musical, artistic works, producers of cinematograph films do copyright their films, and then sound recordings, musical compositions, and uh, you know all the sculpt- sculptors, sculpt- sculptures, paintings. All of this can be copyrighted, and these rights vary according to the class of work. So copyright just doesn't exist in a work, original piece of work. after it is it, it is even if it is translated into another language copyright subsists in that when you abridge when you make it a small version copyright subsists in that and completion of works and provided you know the permission of the copyright holder is taken suppose i create something i write it and i get it copyrighted or i don't get it copyright also somebody else wants to modify that somebody else wants to you know make an abridged version of that copyright exists even in that abridged version so computer programs are also considered as literary works and they are protected under the copyright act and you have to remember that an idea cannot be copyrighted now i have an idea in my mind and i want to you know i convey this idea to a friend of mine i say see this is my idea and this is what i want to do and uh, you know tomorrow my friend goes and you know copies that idea and brings it into form and shape now, can i sue for infringement infringement of the idea that i have no i cannot do it because my idea cannot be copyrighted i have to bring it to existence and that is when it can be it is copyrighted so registration is not mandatory as soon as your work is created as soon as i write an article as soon as i write a novel there is copyright in it so it is not mandatory it is not voluntary that copyright has to be registered your work immediately you get copyright protection as soon as you write it as soon as you create it as soon as you compose it as soon as you uh, bring it into shape so under indian law registration is not required either for acquiring copyright or for enforcing it in an infringement action of course registration is helpful because it is evidentiary value in a court of law i can if i feel somebody has infringed my work my original piece of work i can go and prove it i it's not like my word against your word in a court of law i try to corroborate my contentions by showing my registration by saying that i have copyright registration it was published it was registered so i have all this evidentiary value and it substantiates what i am contending but whereas if i don't do it it doesn't matter copyright exists but then i would not be able to you know prove substantially my ownership over copyright so it is it is necessary it is essential that if yours is a unique creation your creativity is it's better it's preferred that it is registered now can you you cannot take a photo or an article snippet from another website or another blog or a photo or a music or some composition and and you know pose your yourself when if you do that you will be infringing you just cannot think oh that has not been copyrighted so it doesn't matter no you are still committing a uh, copyright infringement and in other words i know you all know it as plagiarism so in publishing and in copywriting you will have credible third party substantiate substantiation that your work was there even before you posted it if someone steals it of course it's copyright infringement so what do you understand by that your creativity your exclusivity is protected as a author author when you write something as a composer when you compose a music as a designer when you design something and it gives you absolute rights so now I've come in to understand what do i mean when i say authorship author as you all know as it's self explanatory author is somebody who has created the work right now who's it's it is his original piece it's not duplicated it is not copied or whatever it is his own he is the creator of his own original expression and therefore he is called the author and he remains the author even if he assigns it to somebody he still is the author of the work probably after assignment somebody else owns the work or if somebody 
you know, he authorizes somebody to exploit the work or to, you know, produce the work or reproduce the work or do a translation or a modified version, he still remains the author of the original work. So he is the author and the form and the way it is expressed is the he has a copyright over it. And this copyright came into existence even before he registered the copyright. Right? So this is what you'll have to understand. And he's the owner of the copyright, as I told you, unless assigns it to somebody. Suppose it's a work made for hire. Suppose you're working for a company and your company expects you to do some kind of a writing for the company. Probably you're a journalist and you're working for a, a newspaper or, you know, a, a media company. And you're uh, you are writing something which is your, of course, your creation. But this is a work made for hire. They've hired you to make this work. So who gets, who has the ownership over the work? The ownership will, the, the employer will have ownership, undoubtedly. But you remain the author and will remain. Okay? Now, the duration of copyright. How long do you have the duration of copyright? And when does it go into public domain? Now, literary works, artistic work, or musical work, other than photographs, which has a span uh, different from this, this literary, musical, artistic work, they extend from the life of the author, that is from the day it is, comes into existence, then for 60 years after, 60 years from the year in which the author dies. So it subsists. After 60 years, there is no copyright, it's a public, it's a public domain, and you can use the work for your advantage. There's nobody who would be filing an infringement suit. So copyright subsists for the life of the author and 60 years after that. But if suppose the work has not been published, suppose it's posthumous, it's written and it is not published. I just write something and I keep it in. And after me, you know, somebody gets a hold of it or it is not performed. It's a movie script which is written and it's not performed or a drama. And or is it, it is, or if it is a word was say of a broad, broadcasting during the life of the author, the copyright protection will continue for a period of 60 years from the end of the year in which it first came into, you know, uh, public domain, like either by publishing or by production or by, you know, uh, it was sold, whatever, 60 years from then, it will still be under copyright protection. Now, coming to, this is in, uh, whatever I spoke was in respect of literary works and, uh, you know, the other ones, musical and things like that. But when it comes to cinematograph films, photographs, computer programs are also protected. That is from, it is protected from the end of the year in which it was made available to the public. That is with the consent of the owner, of course, the owner would be authorizing it or if it is published or if it is not also, it comes it comes into existence from the year it is published for the next 60 years. And sound recordings as well are protected from for, the, for a period of 60 years from which the recording was published. When it comes to anonymous, where you don't know who the creator, who the author is, or when it is pseudonymous, you don't know who it is, um, more people are there and uh, you don't know the source of its origin. The copyright is still protected. Uh, of course, the author is not in the picture here. The copyright is still protected for 60 years from the end of the year in which the work was made available to the public uh, with the consent of one who had possession of that or who was owner of that. And it continues for 60 years or if at least, or if where you know it is a posthumous work or where uh, the author has died, it continues for, still for a period of 60 years. So that is what you have to know about authorship of a work. Now, uh, talking about international copyright protection, how does your uh, work, suppose you have written a piece or, a, or created a work or composed a work in India. Now, India is a member, as I told you, of both the Bern and convention as well as the universal copyright convention which extended works to all copyright uh, copyrighted works originating from any con convention country whoever have been a signatory to these 
conventions. So they will have the same kind of protection, just as Indian works are protected in those convention countries. The same way, foreign works would also be first published in the country of their origin. And thereafter, they would be accorded the same protection in India without having to undergo any kind of formalities. Because the same way it is assumed that our country works and the same reciprocity is given in other countries for Indian works, the same way. So because we are, uh, you know, India is a member of these convention countries, it's given the same kind of treatment. And if somebody uses your, uh, every, your uh, artwork or your plays on your jingle or the radio or transfers your manual to the internet, makes copies of your song, imitates you, adapts it, whatever, without your permission, of course, you can uh, sue them for infringement. Now, what happens when your copyright is infringed? What do you understand by the word infringement? That is when a person intentionally or intentionally, he copies your work without your consent or permission. It amounts to infringement. That is, you, without you licensing it or without you assigning it or without you selling it, if somebody uh, copies your work, it is infringement of your copyright. So even selling pirated information of somebody. And these damages, suppose, you know, this can be valued, the amount of damages, because it is it has already come into the marketplace because of the infringement. His recognition is lost. Then in those instances, he can claim damages. And he can get his file a suit for injunction before the court of law, restraining the infringing party by, you know, dealing with his copyright, by selling the copyrighted works or by, you know, get a restraining order from the court that he doesn't promote it or sell it in public, offer it for sale, whatever, from dealing with it or destroying these copyrighted works. And he can get that. And he can even get a warrant to enter, you know, search a warrant, an Anton Pillar warrant, which he called it, search the premises of the infringer if he feels that someone has, you know, stored copyrighted pirated software, copyrighted, uh, you know, uh, works which have been, you know, that he has pirated or he has kind of produced, adapt, adapted and made different copies of that, reproduced that without authorization. And he has stored this in his premises. He can always, the person, the plaintiff, that is who files, or who has reason to believe and who has copyright over his work, can get an order from the court for a search warrant and get these works, you know, get this all confiscated and obtain a temporary order for freezing the assets of the defendant, that is the infringing party, and prevent him from disposing of these, uh, you know, pirated and counterfeited and the, the assets which have been kind of thieved. You know, you can do that. And uh, the criminal liability will be of fine if it is proved, if he has really done infringement of someone's copyright, the infringe, infringer Imprisonment can be imposed up to three months, up to which can start from three months to three years, six months to three years, and a two lakh a fine or both uh, can be imposed by the court. But the burden of proof is on the person who states that my work, my copyrighted work, or my work has been infringed. Okay, so this was uh, this is what it is about uh, infringement. Now, what is the procedure? Now, you have uh, you have written a software, or you have written a song, or whatever, whatever composed music, or it's a cinematograph, whatever is your original creative work. This can be registered. So now I would uh, through the slide as you see, we will learn how can this. What is the procedure for registering? copyright and how can we protect it by a copyright registration. Firstly, an applicant or the author, it can be the author, it can be the owner as well, if the author is assigned it. Now, the author or the applicant, applicant could be the owner, could be an applicant who is a legal heir of the author, whatever, suppose the author is not there, a legal heir can take it. So the applicant, which can mean the owner as well or otherwise, or the author can apply for registration of the copyright. It can be a um, if he he wants it to be done through somebody, then a power of attorney is given, and this because and the attorney holder who is the authorized legal representative or otherwise applies in an application. There is a particular application under the Copyrights Act, and he files this application either physically or online 
or through e-filing facility, uh, the uh, copyright.gov.in. That is the website address for the Copyright Office. So for every piece of work, there is one application. It is in Form 4 and accompanied by the requisite fee, and which the fees are, uh, you can find that in the second schedule to the Copyright Rules under the Act. Now, there are various fees. Now, for search, there is a fee. And for there are so many aspects to that. And fees are laid for a musical uh, work. It is a different kind of fees. For a literary work, it is uh, a particular fee. So there's a prescribed fee. Now, it ranges from 500 Indian rupees to 40,000 on the form of the work, on what you are doing. And this fee can be also paid. It's, it's, it's paid through demand draft or... Uh, you know, payable favoring the registrar of copyright at New Delhi through an e-payment or otherwise if it is all sent to here, the DD is kept along with it and sent. Now, what is the information that you have to state in the application? Name of the address and the nationality. Nationality, what you are applying for copyright if you're a resident, Indian resident, you're applying for copyright in your country. And the nature of the applicant's interest. Now, whether he's the author, of course, his interest is he's the author. Suppose it's an applicant, how is he interested in this work? Is he an assignee or is he a legal representative or is he owning the copyright over the work? So his interest is also, you know, told in the application. Then there's a title to everything you do. You give a title, whether it's a song or whether it's poetry, whether it's a story, there's a title, whether it's an article. So the title of the work and the nationality of the author. Suppose this is an author of another nationality. You will have to mention that. Then if it has been published in any other country, now whether it is an unpublished work or published work, that has to be mentioned. Then the year of the publication, when it was first published, the address, the nationality, the name of the publisher. And if it has been subsequently published in other countries, they, where are they convention countries? Are they signatory, signatories to the TRIPS agreement and the Berne Convention and all of that, which I say. And if there has been any authorization given to somebody, has it been sold or has it been licensed to somebody? And the details of that particular person or entity to whom it has been licensed or assigned. And if it is so, if some you know, if the applicant is filing this for copyright, he has to have a no objection from the author saying that he has no objection for this person to go ahead with copyright registration of his work. Now, you have to, along with the application, after all these details have been stated, three copies of the published work has to be produced along with the application. Suppose it is work has not been published at all and it is first you are seeking a copyright registration of your work then two copies of the manuscript must be sent along with it should be duly stamped one will be returned once the registration has been done other will be retained by the copyright office now computer programs are also copyrighted they are not patented and source code and the object code is filed with the copyright office when uh, computer programs are copyrighted of course, when it is registration of an artistic work, it can be registered under the Designs Act or it can be copyrighted also as an artistic work. And But you will have to file an affidavit stating that it's not registered under the Design Act. You don't need to have registration under the Design Act as well as a copyright. All right. Um, and uh, that can be stated. Then, of course, the applicant or the advocate uh, will have to sign it because everything, as you know, should be signed that you have done it. It is kind of a self attestation. And of course, other details as your email address, mobile number, all that have to be stated. Now, what happens when all this is being sent? This application is examined by the uh, person there, the registrar of copyrights. And as soon as the application is received, there is a number given, an application number is given, which means to say is under prof process. This is a provisional number. So once you get this number, there is a mandatory wait for 30 days because if there's any objection on this, if there's any claim made by the author, so there's a 30 days wait. If there's no objection given, you know, then it goes through. But if there's any objection given, the registrar, he can, you know, he conveys that such an objection has been raised to the applicant, and then he gives a hearing to both the applicant and the objector. And after, 
you know, that is kind of solved, then the decision of the ownership or if he feels that there is no basis for an objection made, the objection is rejected and then the application goes for scrutiny and if there is no discrepancy found within 30 days, suppose sometimes the application may be incomplete, some uh, details may not be given, then, you know, discrepancies are there. Uh, right? Then it is then when you will have to uh, the copyright office is, uh, uh, you know, conveys this to the uh, applicant. And then after everything is uh, in place, everything is complied with according to the copyright rules and the act, and further submission of documents and the, the completeness and correctness of the claim, and the, which is entered into the particulars of the registrar of copyrights, a registration of copyright is given, a certificate of copyright is given to the applicant, and the registration is complete and entry is made. In the register of copyrights, it's always there as an evidentiary value. And for anyone to go and look into when a search is made, somebody else wants to make a search, then, you know, he searches into the register of copyrights to see or to check about the details of the registration. So made. Now coming to moral rights in the copyright. Now you will, you will wonder what is moral rights? Now, these are the special rights which an author has got even after assigning his rights over his work. He has a moral right. This is the right of paternity. This is the right of the author to claim authorship over the work. Though he has made money, though he has sold his work, he still retains his paternity rights. Okay? But, and this right of integrity permits this author to restrain or claim damages in the event of a distortion to his work or a mutilation to a work or modification or any untoward act done in his work. So what is essential is this act of mutilation or modification or distortion done, it should in some way prejudice the honor and reputation of the author. That is when under Section 57 of the Copyright Act, he has a right to enforce his right which he has got because his work over which he has paternity rights is being exploited by somebody though that person has the authority as a licensee or as a owner of the copyright or as a applicant whatever he has the right over it but still his his work has been you know ill-treated in some way he has he can proceed under 57 of the copyright act I would like to um, uh, tell you, uh, before going into that, I would like to tell you about a case law, which is, um, you know, uh, if you've all heard of Ilaya Raja, uh, who is a very uh, popular music composer. He had, in fact, uh, his was a long-standing copyright dispute and involving music, uh, uh, you know, music maestro, uh, whom you all know, Eli Raja, where this was a, there's a long-standing copyright dispute between him and uh, a, a film producer. Because, you know, the and then the uh, High Court of Madras, it, the, it kind of uh, made a very proper assertion over, and observed that a music composer has a right over his music composition. And somebody cannot exploit it to the disadvantage of the music composer. So it made a very clear distinction between the music composer's right, film producer's right over sound recordings in a film. Because this was, in, in this particular case, Ilaya Raja was a composer of his musical work. He had authorship rights over it. And whereas the film producer had his sound recording rights, has, has had his uh, music, uh, his film cinematograph rights over it. Now, the court highlighted that the author retains his moral rights over this work, over his composition. And these are recognized as an author's special rights, as I told you under section copyrights. And these rights would subsist, subsist regardless of any contractual obligation. That was the finding of the Madras High Court. Um, in this particular, this is the moral rights, as I said. So, irrespective of the medium of delivery, it was he, this person cannot, you know, do it so as to bring, uh, so as 
the new composition where the film producer works on it is to bring disrepute or prejudice to the interest of the author. Right? This was an important case. There's another case which also I would like to um, bring it into, you know, which was another landmark case. And this was in um, uh, 1957. The government of India had commissioned a person, Mr. Sagal, to create a bronze mural, a bronze mural to create it for the Vigyan Bhavan, which was a prominent international convention hall in Delhi. So this bronze sculpture in question was uh, quite uh, 140 square feet wide and a huge one. It was a beautiful, uh, had become a art, an Indian heritage, a creative piece which he had, uh, you know, constructed. <laughs> Sorry, so he had created this and this was placed in the lobby of this international convention hall at Delhi and it was a beautiful work of art, you know, it was a part of the Indian art heritage and belonged to uh, and, and was deemed a national architecture. Now, when this was so, in 1979, that was almost after 22 years of its creation, this mural was pulled down and it was, you know, taken down and consigned to a storeroom in the union office uh, without, no notice was given, no permission was taken from the uh, from Mr. Segal who had created it and there was no authorization given by Segal to do that. Now, when Segal came to know of this ill-treatment to his creation, he was, of course, very disturbed and distressed over it that he gave representations to the government. However, it was of no avail and nobody, uh, you know, took uh, any kind of an action over that. So he was constrained to go to the court under 57 of the Copyright Act. And the question here was whether he had a right on the sculpture which had been, which he has created and handed it over, which he has already commissioned. And how does it help? Now, when this was done and, uh, you know, the court decided and he had sought, in fact, he had sought for an apology from the defendants and he had sought for a permanent injunction and for distorting, for mutilating the plaintiff's mural and damages. And then he had also sought for 50 lakhs compensation, which was granted. So this was another case where moral rights came into the picture, which is quite prominent and popular, which had to be mentioned. So this is about the moral rights in a copyright. Uh, next, going to compulsory licensing in copyright. See, Indian Copyright Act provides for compulsory licensing of copyright that have been withheld from public. And that is what, what do you understand when I say withheld from public? That is the copyright owner has refused to part with it and it is and it is a very uh, you know useful piece and this has been withheld from public or it has the performance has been withheld and then you know you uh, the publication of it has been withheld without any reason then the then the applicant can apply for compulsory licensing of the copyright because the copyright owner does not want to you know give it so then when it has been has withheld it so that is when you, the applicant can apply for compulsory licensing and the Copyright Board will give an opportunity, a reasonable opportunity and look into why it has been done so. And he can direct the registrar of the Copyright Board, can direct the registrar of copyright to grant a compulsory licensing to the complainant to republish the work or to communicate to the public in, as deemed. So it can be granted even in case of unpublished Indian works where the author is dead or unknown and somebody has possession and does not want to, you know, uh, publish it. Uh, so you can ask, uh, the apply to the copyright board and seek a license to publish the work. It is to ensure the availability of copyrighted material. So copyright, uh, Indian Copyright Act, as you have seen this far, it gives protection to writers and artists so that they benefit from the result of their hard work and to ensure that that copyrighted material is available to the public without infringing the rights of the copyright owner. Uh, before going into that, I would uh, like to uh, talk about uh, another important case, uh, which was Entertainment Network India Limited was a super cassette industries limited. So in this case, Radio Mirchi was playing a music 
and uh, uh, where and the copyright rights were held by Super Cassette India, which was Industries, which was the defendant. But as um, Radio, uh, which was the applicant in this case, and Radio Mirchi was playing music without taking any kind of permission from Super Cassette Industries, the rights for it. And while the suit was pending, they had applied, and when uh, they had applied to the copyright court for a compulsory licensing of these music, of the music which Radio Mirchi was playing. Now, it was then known that, you know, this compulsory license or license was already granted to All India Radio and Radio City. But without obtaining any kind of permission from Super Cassette Industries, Radio Mirchi was free. So that is when the Copyright Board felt that compulsory licensing cannot be given here because this work is not withheld from public. All India Radio has got it, has got the license, and as well as Radio City has got it. Therefore, Radio Mirchi could not apply for compulsory license and the case was dismissed. Okay, so this is one case of compulsory license. Now coming to computer works in copyright, as I told you, computer works are considered as literary works under the Copyright Act. What are uh, computer or literary works for computer programs can be computer programs, tables, compilations, computer databases, and all in any tangible form, whether in, in a ROM or in a magnetic disk, uh, any tangible medium, they get copyright protection as soon as they come onto this medium, okay, whether it's a magnetic tape, a disk, or a ROM, and uh, copyright for computer programs, process, copying of computer structure and design, which you have to know. And when does it come into being? As soon as the original lines of a source code is done by the programmer. So another, suppose there's another addition and there's a, there's a separate copyright. And this source code, there is some other addition, some other modification to a source code, then a copyright exists. So there can be any number of copyrights and need not be protected by a single copyright. But of course, modification is also protected. And as soon as this source code comes into uh, existence, a copyright, you get copyright over your computer program. And it begins, though object code and source code both are given, the actual instructions, because actual instructions which are contained, both are given for copyright registration to the copyright office. Okay, because they both are considered equivalent for registration purposes. So how do you, how is software or copyright infringed, as you all know, through, uh, you know, piracy and uh, piracy means reproduction, distribution, and whatever. And then, of course, without having a license, you know, making many copies and using unlicensed because you get it at a cheaper price, application, sale of software, all this amounts to infringement of the copyright so this is what you need and what is copyright how what is the procedure for application what does infringement mean and what can be copyright so this is in short copyright our uh, next topic is um, ICT which is uh, information and communication technology ICT and innovation in the state now what do you understand by information and communication technology. I'm sure all of you all know because it uh, refers to, you know, access to information through telecommunication and communication technologies. And communication technologies are internet, wireless networks, cell phones and other communication mediums. Now, modern information and communication technologies have created a global village. Today, people can communicate just as I'm doing now. People can communicate in real time, video conferencing, voice over IP, instant messaging, and technology. And it is the technology advancement of technology, which is really, you know, rapidly advanced in today's world and has made the world, you know, a very small place where people can just, over a phone call, over a WhatsApp call, can communicate. And uh, this is so you have access to information through telecommunication and through communication technology. So this is what information communication technology is, which you all know. Now, if you know the statistics, I just got it for you. 100% of 
in the ICT sector and India is one of the fastest growing economy in the world. Of course, due to this COVID break, our outbreak, it has slumped considerably. Whereas, but it was the fastest growing and the third largest group of scientists and technology experts are from India. And uh, it's, it ranks the eighth among uh, in the World Trade Organization members, eighth in export of services concerning information technology and IT-enabled uh, services. And it's the most preferred destination uh, for foreign investment in the IT and ICT sectors, which all of you are all aware of. So what is ICT innovation? As you know, innovation, the very um, word, defines it is something new to the knowledge. It is new to the world. It is your knowledge of technology, which is diffused and absorbed in knowledge diffusion, absorption, you can call it, and it is commercialized, right? This is ICT innovation, if you uh, uh, get it. Now, ICT innovation is in the application of uh, digital and communication technology. So whatever innovation is made, in, uh, it can, it's embedded in the computational solutions. And uh, Joseph's computer, he introduced the notion of innovative economy and said uh, technological changes, they are at the heart of the economy. Whereas an intellectual property plays a very significant role. You would be wondering how intellectual property and ICT innovation. Of course, as I already told you, computer programs, any innovation made in technology can be protected under the intellectual property. It is a significant role because it helps businesses to gain and retain its innovation based, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is an advantage over innovation based uh, knowledge and technology. And it facilitates the process of innovation technology because it takes it to the marketplace where inventions are protected and intellectual property gives you that protection over your uh, innovation or when it is taken. And that's how, you know, there are so many multi um, corporations and MNCs in India and hired Indian companies for technology advancement. And how is this all protected? You have uh, uh, protection over your intellectual property, which your country is given and it's got, got the same recognition and protection because India is a member of all the other uh, conventions world uh, international agreements. So that is the protection intellectual property gives over your ICT innovation so that you uh, investors also, uh, based on this, get funding and licensing on various strategic businesses types. They are being uh, adjudged on this basis. And also, uh, whatever is patented and copyrighted, rivals cannot copy it and claim it to be theirs. That is what IP protection is given to ICT innovation. As you know, the growth of our nation is driven by economic growth. And the key technologies that are underpinning the evolution of the digital economy, like, uh, you know, IoT, Internet of Things, big data, cloud computing, advanced robotics, all of this, these are the key technologies that have kind of evolved where our digital uh, economy is in all evolved. And the key drivers of the growth of sector will be digital transformation later on. As you see, artificial intelligence is really growing in a very, very fast pace. And Internet of Things and uh, intellectual property-led businesses, the 5G network, and uh, adopted by many Indian industries and collaborating with other industries from other countries, MSMEs in our own country. So it has uh, really helped. ICT has helped deliver government, improved government service in terms of e-governance, increased transparencies, and, you know, disbursement of government scholarship, digital payments, online education course, virtual courses. And, um, so, uh, you know, there has been constant innovation in technology. And also, as you can see, and of course, when it comes to economy, boosting the economy, there are joint ventures, there are mergers, there are licensing agreements made between, uh, uh, collaborations made between business entities, acquisitions, and there's a strong negotiating position because of your ICT innovation. And government also had these three kind of flagship programs, you know, like uh, Start India, Make Up India, and uh, Digital India. These were the government support and incentives for ICT sector. Now, Digital India was a flagship program of the government of India. So it was a digital, which felt that digital infrastructure was a core utility 
right? And it was important. And this was uh, supported and an incentive given to the ICT sector. Then a flagship in initiative of Government of India was Startup India. This was so nurturing innovations in startups so that economic growth and large scale employment opportunities, you know, how many people are employed in the technology sector and the ICT sector and IT industries. So that was employment opportunities. And, uh, you know, startups were given a lot of support from the government, especially IT, as you all know. And then uh, it was, there was a government introduced the Startup India Hub, which was an online platform for all stakeholders from the startup ecosystem in India. This included startups, investors, mentors, incubators, angel investors, accelerators, and aspiring entrepreneurs, service providers, government bodies. You know, then uh, the other one was the Make in India, where the government encouraged companies to manufacture these products, software, whatever it was, hardware, so that investment was increased. And, you know, India is an IT hub today, and it is placed on the global map. So, and the Niti Aayog's report, that is National Institute of Transformation, India, this was on, this also had this report on innovation and entrepreneurs. And highlights was this, of this report was to, you know, adequate framework should be given for innovation and how it can be promoted. And so various uh, awareness programs have been decided design sensitization programs to all the stakeholders for their inventions and innovations. And uh, a roadmap was given in the national IPR policy. These are the different supports that we got from the government. And that is why there was a lot of innovations which were fostered. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it uh, and India uh, has seen rapid growth, a significant momentum in technology. And the institutional mechanism was also, uh, uh, you know, it was, inst it was strengthened by transferring the administration of the Copyright Act, the Semiconductor Integrated Circuits Layout Design Act to the uh, Department of Intellectual Property Protection. In, and as result, this has in, in resulted in an integrated approach between the various acts and the IP Intellectual Property Office. And again, uh, to make the process more user-friendly, there was an amendment to the patent rules. 1970 Patent Act was amended constantly First, to be in compliance with TRIPS agreement later on again in 2003 to re-engineer the business process. This was again amended. And this, this amendment was helpful because it expedited the examination of patents and more patent examiners were appointed. Where two or three were there, there were 11 appointed so that no patents don't have to be queuing up, you know, because it takes four or five years to get a baby. It is really a long time. And, uh, you know, essentially to commercially exploit, everybody wants to get patent over the invention. And this was, you know, being delayed. In fact, utility patents was recognized because so that small time patents were given. And uh, so uh, to make it more competent and more people were appointed and the process of exam examination was expedited, expedited so that, you know, this was another uh, re-engineering of the process was taken. And even the trademark ex uh, examiners were added in addition to those who were uh, already there. Then uh, creativity, innovation, and a scheme named that Startups Intellectual Property Protection was launched. And that way it was increased and, uh, you know, 80% rebate was given in patent filings as well. Of course, computer-related inventions, as I told you, are, uh, there is lack of IP protection when it comes to, because patents are not awarded. And this is a main area of concern because they're mostly copyrighted. You know, they are not given patents. So uh, so the role of intellectual property and I ICT is currently protected under ICT, is protected under the Copyright Act. So because it has software-related uh, invention have a technical implementation implication because they cannot be patented. They are only copyrighted as programs, or compilations, or, or computational solutions. So once an entity develops a technology and expands that their ICT base, isn't it? It becomes necessary to protect IPR so that their innovation is promoted and uh, they are given fair prices for their technology and they are valued on the basis of that. Now today's paper, there's so many mergers and collaborations taking place. And that's technology because of the techno technology advancement and innovation of that particular entity. But they are not protected under patents, computer programs, especially, and technology is protected under 
copyright software. So there, there's a way to uh, so a way to increase patent filings in, through greater collaboration between IP offices of the world was also promoted and. Um, to see how Indian patent data can be become a part of the global patent system and exchange so that, you know, it reduces pendency wars. So this is about ICT innovation. Uh, I could say IP and ICT innovation in short. And now coming, um, if there is something you want to know about the Designs Act, though it is not in the curriculum today, I can tell that as well. And tomorrow we go into patents and trademarks as such, to know into the nitty gritties of what Patent Act is about, Indian Patent Act, the Trademarks Act, and the um, Integrated Semi-Circuit Layout Design Act, and Geographical Indication of Goods Act. These are the acts tomorrow we will go through. And this uh, is the different aspects of intellectual property rights in India. So if there's any questions that you would like to ask, uh, since I have the time uh, for the next 15 minutes, you can ask me that. Or uh, if the administrators allow, I can briefly talk about the Designs Act, though I don't have a PowerPoint presentation on the same. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay, uh, since I haven't got any questions as such, I would uh, uh, briefly tell you about the Designs Act. Now, see, when India became a member of uh, state of the World Trade Organization in the year 1995, uh, consequent, uh, so in 1911, there was the Patents and Designs Act, and everything was under the Patents and Designs Act. But once it became a member of the WT, the World Trade Organization, 1995, and, and, and a patent was amended in compliance with the TRIPS, then, you know, the Design Act was taken off, and it was only the Patents Act, and the Designs Act came into existence. And the objective of this Designs Act in 2000 was, the primary object was to protect designs. Now, any new and original designs were protected from getting copied, so that the creator, the originator, the artisan who has created this design, who has created a shape, um, uh, object of design, you know, can be protected. And, you know, uh, it obviously draws the customer's attention, isn't it? Because there is commercial value to the article so created. So all these, so these were protected under the Design Act. Now, what is design actually? So under the Design Act, it is defined as the feature of any shape, any configuration, any uh, ornament. It can be an ornament, it can ornament, it can be a pattern. And this can be, this ornament or pattern can be applied to a two-dimension or a three-dimension, whatever. Both, uh, it can be manual, it can be chemical, it can be mechanical, some kind of a design, you know, on a finished article. Now, this is meant as a design under the Designs Act, and it has protection under this Design Act. Now, when I say article, on an article, this design, this, this can be of any substance, natural or artificial. The object can be, and it should be capable of being made and sold separately. Now, what are the essential requirements? Now, can anything be registered? No. It should be novel. There should be novelty and originality. What is important is novelty and originality. A design can be considered as original if it is new, it is not copied, it has its own originality, nobody has published it, it is non-obvious, and, and it is unique. Only then it can be registered. And a prior publication is not acceptable. It should not have priorly public uh, published. That is, it means it should not be on any tangible copy and it should not be already available in the world. And then if and somebody should have not sought for registration, then it can be registered under the design plan. And you have to, the application of design should be to the article. It should not be a design separately, which you're going to present it. it sh the design should have been applied on the article. It is only then. Now, if you just do a design and it's an exquisite design and you want to copyright it, it can be a piece of artistic work, but if for it to be registered under the Designs Act, it needs to be on an object, on an article, right? And it must, and the last and most important thing, this design should not be contrary to the order and morality. 
So it should not be under or contrary to public order and morality in that sense, which is obscene or which is indecent, which is, does not confirm to the standards of morality, such a design cannot be registered. So, as I said, uh, the, to ensure that the following features in the design are, as I said, must be original, it must be purely distinguishable, it cannot be similar to something else, it cannot relate to obscenity or inappropriateness. Now, this design is given for a period of 10 years and with the payment of uh, with the prescribed fee, it can be extended to five more years. So, it is for an annual, at the end of 10 years, you have to renew it for another period. So, that is the duration of uh, you know, uh, registration in this. And who is again entitled to registration? The author of the design is uh, entitled to registration and um, uh, a particular fee has to be paid. And, uh, you know, even suppose he, uh, the original, suppose the design is made as a work for hire. You're working for some company or some architect and you made this over an object or some architectural design. Then, of course, it's a work for hire. However, it can be registered and both the employer can seek in these matters. In other cases, the author or the creator of the design, not the author, the creator of the design can seek. In a, when it comes to performance, the performer, whoever has performed it. So it, it's an author when it comes to literary works. It's the artist when it comes to design. Now, as I said, the registration is similar to that of copyright. As you register, an application is fine. The piece is given, the piece is sent, and then, you know, he examines if there are objections. Objections are heard by both the sides. There's no validity to the objection. They reject it, and this is registered under the Society's Act. And the objection, within three months, there's no objection. Or if, if suppose, the person does not, uh, you know, uh, again, communicate with the um, Registrar of Designs, then if the application is, deemed abandoned. Otherwise, it is all done in a period of three months. And the controller of, of uh, designs, you know, he, after verifying and after verifying his novelty and after verifying uh, the originality of the design, and if there is no objection, he class and it is classified. There are classes under which it is specified. He would register it in that specific class. And because there is, uh, everything has its own class. Some it because or depending on the object it is done. Some it could have been done on a piece of cloth, a textile. It could be done on a piece of a uh, you know a natural substance. It could be done on a piece of an uh, an uh, uh, you know an iron object. It could be anything. It could be in any object. So depending on that, there are classes under which they are registered. So it can be signs. It can be emblems. It, the article can be of any size, structure, buildings. Uh, integrated circuit layout designs and books, calendars, mechanical, you know, contrivance and all this, all the parts of an art article, uh, a workshop article, parts of an equipment, industrial equipment and all this. As I told you, there is a initial for registration is a fee of, uh, I guess, 2000 rupees or something. And then it depends again on what all has been uh, asked to be filed, what kind of design it is. So this is about the Designs Act, which was passed, where designs can be registered. So thank you. I, I'm sorry there have been uh, I think a lot of disturbances for audio, but I hope uh, it's been clear. And now I would request you to uh, ask any questions that you would like to ask. Uh, someone's asked me, uh, can you send the PowerPoint presentation? Yes, I could do that. Uh, if you can send an email ID, I can type. Uh, I don't know. I, I will have to ask the organizers. Uh, can I send my email ID to the participants that if they want a PowerPoint presentation, if I can send it to them? Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes, yes okay. Yes, yes. So I will just uh, type my email ID. Uh, uh, so, if you can uh, send me a uh, uh, link, I will send it to you. Uh. Uh, 
Thank you. And there's a question. If I publish a book with ISBN number apart from copyright, can I use any of IPR? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see the name from whom it was addressed. Anyways, okay, to your question, I told you a copyright subsists as soon as the work is created. So registration is not mandatory. The, the time you create it, it, there is copyright. As if someone infringes on that, you have copyright protection. So registration is non-mandatory. Once you have made it known, you are the author, you have the ownership over that. So even if you write your ISP number or whatever it is, you don't need to register unless you think it is necessary to, because your copyright has come into being the moment you created it for in a medium that can be, you know, shown. Okay. Now, uh, yes, I will send the PPT. The next question is all of the requested. Yeah. Any other questions you have on copyright, on intellectual property? Is there anything else? Uh, everyone's thanking me and I'm, it's my pleasure and I deem it a privilege to be your uh, resource person today. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, okay, there's another question. Uh, good afternoon. When I publish a YouTube me video under Creative Commons as open educational resource, do I still hold membership? Definitely, if it is your original creative creation. Whatever you now, if even if it's on YouTube, it's your original creation. If somebody else copies that, they have to take your permission or they will have to quote you. They cannot pass it off as they are the owner or they are the ones who have, you know, published this. So once you have published it on YouTube and it is your original piece of work, 100% you have authorship rights over it and copyright. Is it, this is from Mrs. Bacon. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, I have uh, from Professor Shankar, I have a YouTube channel. What should be, I have to know this to avoid from any copyright problems. Okay, uh, so um, uh, your YouTube channels, I'm, I'm sure there would be many followers and everyone knows it's your YouTube channel. Nobody can replicate that because it is in public domain and you have your uh, you know, your exclusivity, your rights over it, unless you allow somebody to replicate your presentations or whatever you're doing. So no one can do that. And your question, that's a very good question. Is probably you may not know it, but I'm sure that if you go on Google and you search it and you see if there's somebody else with the same content, you will never get to know, right? Because you have not, um, uh, there's no way, there's no foolproof method where you get to know that. But of course you have certain mechanisms where you can find that out yourself. Uh, through searches or through somebody else intimating to you. Yes, because even if you copy, if you register it, you know, registration only gives you a protection that, you know, it is registered and you can sue somebody for damages, you can sue somebody for infringement, for compensation, whatever. But if you have not registered it, you will, you will not be able to do it. So when you do that, uh, when I say when you will not be able to, you will still be able to do it, but you have more evidentiary value when you have registered it. So if somebody if your YouTube channel, it will come to your knowledge. Uh, and how can we apply IPR in connection with English language projects? Now, um, I don't know what your specific question is. There's an IP, you don't apply for IPR, you apply for copyright. Because if I say your English language project, I presume that is in uh, a literary work or it could be a a visual, uh, you know, a virtual recording. I mean, it could be that, right now. If you are, you are going to uh, want to copyright it, you can of course copyright your your program can be copyrighted, and no one else can copy. And if anyone else copy, you're free to you know sue. You can apply to copyright registration, as I told you, application setting your uh, HS3 in uh, format. Suppose it is a it's a it's a something which you have it's given a name to it. Now you want the cop name to be copyrighted, or suppose you want the content to be copyrighted. You send it ten copies, and along with uh, filling the application form, giving all the details about you, your nationality, and your interest in the work, you send it to the copyright office. You get a copyright. 
once all everything is clear there's no objection it is original it is your creation you have rights over it as an author as the creator you get your copy so any project any english language project any compilation any uh, computer program artistic any musical work can be copyrighted okay uh, any other question can you send yes i will send a powerpoint present i have i have kind of uh, my email id so you just let me know who wants it and i will send it see actually if i if you look at uh, intellectual property is a very vast area you know if we uh, in our law colleges we teach it over a year okay over six months and there is so much to it but i have kind of you know made it a very abridged Hello? content to make you understand what it is essential that you should know uh, that's all you know so kind of i put it all together collected it from the net and made it very small because if i have to go into the details what the hours are and as i told you the syllabus and the content will take almost a year in law it's a subject in itself and there's so many aspects to it when you go into different rights what is different literary works dramatic works there's so many case laws on that it's a huge vast portion so i've tried to to make it as simple as possible because i was told most of you are not aware of it so i will do it okay there's somebody in the class Preventive uh, and safety measures about copyright issues and the uh, need uh, now. Okay, you've said you can understand. Okay, thank you. I thought you were asking me a question. Now, um, what is the next? We all of the participants requested to fill. Okay, so this is about it. Uh, is there anything else, uh, uh, administrators? Can I ask you? Uh, I think there are any other questions coming in. because on my or you know it shows on my monitor the no more questions hello deya parveen is there any question deya parveen no no almost all sim sorry ah yes ma'am hello yes hello yeah please go ahead Hello ma'am yes please go ahead yeah i can hear you yes ma'am i think all the queries have been resolved ha huh. you too uh, all the questions have been answered okay okay so uh, the session ends here so i will meet you again all of you all thank you so much for participation and for bearing with all the uh, you know interruptions thank you it was indeed my pleasure so i will meet you all tomorrow with uh, more awareness on patents copyrights and other geographical indications i mean sorry trademarks geographical indications and other aspects of intellectual property rights thank you yes, and bye have a good day thank you just a minute ma'am yes yeah thank our resource person mrs dula for enriching our knowledge by any presentation clear explanations real life examples like leeraja and radio mirchi cases and clarifying doubts with more patience thank you so much ma'am welcome thank you i would like to thank all our organizers and let us all meet tomorrow for the second session of fdp uh, participants please check your mail for the links before the session could end let me tell about the feedback forms feedback for link will be shared in the chat box at the end of each session the link will be open for one hour you need to fill uh, feedback forms of both the days Only, only participants who attend both the days of FDP and the feedback from for both the sessions will receive each certificate probably within a week. Thank you, and thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for an informative session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let's meet tomorrow. Thank you, ma'am. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you, ma'am.